Discovering Trek and the Trek Geeks Podcast Network are proud to have Fansets as our presenting sponsor. Fansets is the place for amazing pin collectibles with over 300 officially licensed Star Trek pins and new releases every month. Keep listening to this episode for a special discount code good on your next order at fansets.com. Fansets, our pins have character. A burn, a guardian, and a chain. Season 3 of Star Trek Discovery took us literally where no Star Trek show has gone before. The season is a wrap, and there were lots of amazing storylines. What did we think of the third season of Discovery and the upgraded NCC-1031-A? Well, let's find out. Welcome aboard, everyone. My name is Dan Davidson, and we are Discovering Trek. Welcome, one and all, to Discovering Trek, the Star Trek Universe Companion, presented by Fansets. Another Star Trek season has come to an end, and so did 23 straight weeks of new Star Trek. It was a great ride, and, and I'm not going to lie, I'm already in withdrawal a little bit. As always, this is the premier podcast for the most in-depth discussion and analysis about Season 3 of Star Trek Discovery. Ups and downs, highs and lows, callbacks and new adventures, this season really solidified its place in Star Trek lore. And as always, I am honored and, well, simply humbled to introduce one of my amazing co-hosts. While I thoroughly enjoy 23 straight weeks of new Star Trek, 23 straight weeks with this guy might be asking a little bit too much... So I think it's time for a little vacation. As always, he is my very special friend, my brother in Trek, and my amazing number one. He is Bill Smith, and Bill, um, no new Star Trek now, man. What are we? What are we going to do? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to not talk to you as much. And, I'm going uh, to Disney World. I'm a, no, you're not. Nice. No, and I'm not until May. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and fingers crossed that you actually get to go in May. Oh, we're going point. no matter what. Now, even if we stay in our cabin, we're we're going. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'll be glad when you're gone okay um, then hi no i mean hey buddy it's good to be back happy to wrap up the season <laughs> 23 straight weeks uh, we did get a week off in there since the last one so i mm-hmm. I, I i feel refreshed and i think our returning co-hosts feel refreshed as well welcome back sarah and casey it's good to have you back hi good to be here <laughs> Hey, everybody. 23 What's weeks. Happening? You guys are talking like it's 28 weeks later or something. The horror <laughs> film down it, there. it feels God. like it, though, doesn't it? Oh, my God. I'm ready to start, like, zombieing around and everything. It's It's been, we're, we're stuck in the cabin, so to speak, right? Anyway, wrong movie? Okay, we'll move right along. Um, it is great to have all of us back again uh, uh, for one more time. To, I don't even know where this is going. Uh, one more time to discuss the season. But uh, before we do that, Bill, we always want to hear from our listeners about their thoughts on everything Discovery. So uh, how can they get in touch with us for their thoughts on Discovery's third season? Priority one message from Starfleet coming in on Secured Channel. Well, if you're looking to get in touch with us, there really are a bunch of ways you can do that very thing. Of course, you can go to trekgeeks.com slash contact and find a variety of ways to get us your thoughts. And of course, on Twitter or Facebook, all you have to do is search for at Discovering Trek. Of course, we welcome all of your questions and comments. You can also leave us a voicemail by visiting our website at trekgeeks.com and clicking on the giant blue button. Please remember, though, that any comments you leave us might be used in a future episode of said Discovering Trek. Dan. Thank you, Bill. Black alert. Black alert. From here on in, folks, this episode of Discovering Trek will contain spoilers. So if you haven't watched Star Trek Discovery Season 3, stop listening right now. Head on over to CBS All Access or wherever you watch Discovery. Binge watch the whole season, then head back on over to Discovering Trek. Failure to do that puts you at risk to find out plot developments and character details for Season 3 of Star Trek Discovery. Trainees, to the briefing room. Well, Sarah and gentlemen, we are going to gather in the briefing room as we do every single week to start our discussion on season three. So let's get our high level thoughts for the entire season. Was it a thumbs up and or was it a thumbs down? And maybe a quick uh, heads up as to why. And Casey, we'll start with you this week, buddy. Hey, OK, thank you. I think it's a definite thumbs up. Uh, the season progressed 
the narratives for a lot of our characters uh, really opens things up for next season. And, you know, we got to see flaws and doubts uh, in characters, which I think that made them more relatable and real. Absolutely. Sarah, how about you? I am going to give it um, two happy thumbs up, not ecstatic, but just two good thumbs up. I had big hopes for this season and it almost delivered on all of it. And I'm, I'm ready for the next season. So let's just do it. All right. Well, I'll start talking to the producers about that. Bill, what about you? <laughs> uh, I'm going to go thumbs up as well. I think that this season was a very solid season of Star Trek and that it struck a nice balance in working toward the overall season arc, as well as having, having some rather episodic moments throughout the season. Um, I, I think that this achieved a good balance almost in the same way that Deep Space Nine used to with its, with its arc storytelling. Absolutely. So we're going to go uh, all four of us with thumbs up. I, too, am going to give it a thumbs up. As everyone remembers from the end of last season, I was really concerned about how it was going to be after the end of season two. Um, I was nervous about what they were going to be able to do with being set almost a thousand years into the future. I was very, very satisfied with how the season went. I think it was one of the strongest of the season so far for Discovery. I don't know if I would yet give it the best season. I have to digest it a little bit more and really think about it. But it was definitely, definitely a thumbs up for me. So as we discuss different aspects of the season, I think the first thing I want to do, guys, is let's talk about um, what your... two or three favorite things of the entire season ones. It could be anything. It doesn't have to be a specific story or character. It could be anything you want. So Sarah, let's start with you. Let's get your three favorite things about Star Trek Discovery season three. Okay, okay. I have three things here for you. I like the fact that they gave Michael Burnham a year to herself there before she had her reunion. I think it was a really great way to kind of je- develop the character and take her down a different route. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed the way that they gave us a send off and a goodbye for Philippa because it was one of those things that everyone kind of knew was going to come, but you didn't know how they were going to do it. And I thought it was a really clever way. And I liked the Emerald Chain in general. I thought it was a good villainous um, character storyline to have going on, and I was intrigued by them. And I don't know, that was that was another plus for me. I gotta say, I really like what you say about the send off for Philippa because whether or not we get a Section Thirty One show, I think her the way that she exited Discovery was good whether we see her again or not Mm -hmm. um we know that she is going to survive we know that she's been sent somewhere so that she can um continue to live and 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 continue to have the change in the way that her thinking was from when she was empress and uh whether we see her in section 31 which i hope we do i think everybody here wants to see her it's top billing on a star trek show Mm -hmm. um if it happens awesome if it doesn't it was a satisfying ending to her character so uh i really like what you said about that bill uh what about you man what are your three top things for season three of discovery well i I think i have to start with you know the lack of there being an evil or nefarious cause of the burn the fact that it wasn't tied to somebody trying to intentionally do harm to starfleet and the federation i think that was really important for this season to have that kind of quality because it kind of gets it closer to the star trek that people grew up with in many ways Second, I have to say the promotion of Michael Burnham. I think it's long overdue. Um, I can't remember which week I predicted it. I think it was early on, but I said that by season's end, she would be the captain of the Discovery somehow. And I'm just glad that it happened. And I'm glad that it happened at the end of the season because I think that makes sense. And then lastly, I have to say the opportunities given to some of the bridge crew. I'm really happy about this year. They got some really prominent features, whether, you know, it was um, a Detmer flying book ship or, you know, Owo saving everybody, you know, by causing that explosion in the warp nacelle or the various fights that occurred in, in other episodes. I thought that they had some really great opportunities to stand out this year. And I think that that was super important. Very good uh, uh, three examples. So far, six out of six is pretty good. I'm going to say that for me, um, uh, bringing back the Guardian of Forever was one of the highlights of the season for me. It may have been a small thing, and it may not have had a whole lot to do with the overall arc of the season. It was just fantastic to see it. So that was one of my one of my top things. Another one for me was the character of Rin. Absolutely uh, 
uh, loved that character. He was only in three episodes, um, but he really had a lot to do with the season. We had the uh, honor of talking with Noah Everback Katz last week, and it was great to talk to him and, and get his inside scoop on the character. And I really appreciated what he had to say. And again, I said it week after week. Admiral Vance was just fantastic. He was a great character. It was so good that we did not have him turn into a bad guy that we actually talked about at one point during the season. So those are my three favorite things for uh, for season three. And, and Casey, what do you got, man? Well, I'm going to dovetail a little bit on right there. The last thing you said, uh, you know, we got a we got a dadmiral instead of a badmiral, which <laughs> thank God they didn't go down that road. Um great actor and and a nice setup for everything else that's going to be going on uh loved the book character you know having a strong male character of color uh coming in which also then expanded things for the character of burnham to be able to experience and go through i thought really was a nice spark that was necessary for this season and then yeah burnham achieving the captain's share i mean she she is your top build actor and character. So it's like, when when are we going to see this fulfillment? And yep. seeing her in that chair and those spiffy gray unis, I dug it. Do you think it was any... Uh, I've seen this online a little bit over the past uh, few days. Do you think there was any um, anything purposeful in the fact that we finally got to see Berna become captain in season three, similar with Cisco? in season three of Deep Space Nine. Season finale of Deep Space Nine, season three, he became captain. I think it's a stretch for people making that comparison, but I just kind of figured I'd ask you guys. I think it's a coincidence. I don't think there's anything to tie to it other than they knew they wanted to make Burnham the captain at the end of the season. Yeah. Yeah. And then wasn't it with all this stuff going on with Pike and Spock in season two that, you know, original planning was not that much of it. Mm -hmm. So who knows? This could have been something that they had planned for season, the end of season two and then right. just pushed out. Sure. So we have the top three favorite things from each of us uh, here on the show. So that means that we're also going to talk about the least favorite things of season three. And they may be few and far between, but I'm sure that uh, we can each think of something because it's not like it's a 100% love fest all the time. Um, so uh, let's start with Bill this time. Bill, what do you got for the, your least favorite moments of season three? Well, I have to say, um, it, I thought about this a, a long time, and I think I'm, uh, I've been fairly consistent about my critiques on these particular aspects. And I'm going to start with the payoff on the buildup to revealing the burn. I really feel that that was a, a bunch of, um, oh my God, what is the burn? Hey, what's the burn? Oh, we got to find out the cause of the burn. And then it was very anticlimactic when they discovered that what the burn actually was. Um, the way it was explained further in the finale was incredibly deep and emotional and well done. But the build up to all of that um, took a whole lot more episodes than it really should have. Second, I have to say, um, my least favorite, one of my least favorite things in the season is the fact that we went all the way to Navarre, but didn't go down to the planet. Incredible mm. wasted opportunity. True. You can't go all the way to the planet formerly known as Vulcan and not look at how it's changed, especially when the central character in your series grew up there. It's a touchstone moment. Yeah, it would have point. done so much for Burnham. Um, and I thought it would have been much better than having that ceremony up on Discovery. And then lastly, as much as I appreciate uh, the job that Mary Wiseman did as Tilly this season and loved her performances, writing Tilly into the first officer spot was a vast mistake in my eyes. That's very interesting. I know a lot of people agree with that. I know a lot of people loved seeing her in that role, but I'm glad that, I'm glad that you brought that up. Uh, Sarah, how about you? What did you think were your, your three, uh, dare I say, low points mm-hmm. for the season? Yeah, you know, this was actually a tough one for me because... Um, the three things that I chose, I don't actually wish to change them. I'm I'm actually quite happy with how the season played out and I'm excited to see what they come up with next. But I kind of took the idea of when I was sitting down to watch the first episode and I had my own ideas about what to see and it didn't happen. So how that I can explain that, I don't know. But here it goes. I didn't like that there was so many rotating people in different positions of who's captain, who's second in command, who's, and not even just this season, but in general, I just, it's giving me a hard time getting really attached to somebody in a certain role. Um, 
I didn't like the burn in general. I kind of wasn't expecting that to be a storyline. I was kind of expecting or hoping for them to show up in the future and Starfleet is thriving, but maybe completely different or I just was expecting something else. So um, I chose that. And then I just didn't really fall in love with the storyline of where Michael Burnham's mother played into the season and how she came back. It wasn't, again, what I was expecting, but I didn't really know what to expect. But I was like, oh, okay. Whatever. But they were they I can, were all still good things. It's just, you know, you gotta pick something. I can hundred percent uh relate to what you say about the whole Michael's mother aspect of season three. It seemed way too convenient to have mm-hmm. her all of a sudden showing up mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. where she was and what she was doing. So yeah, those are very good three uh uh points that were, were least favorite for the season. Casey, let's go with you, man. What do you got? Well well, you all know my big beef with you know, Zara, this wasted <laughs> awful paper thin villain um i thought it was a really wasted opportunity for a good actor you know jake weber i I really dug him in meet joe black and you know we all knew we all knew uh he would be back when it was just all of us and they kind of wrote the whole hey we hope you forget about this character so that we can later on bring him back and like oh surprise and there was no surprise there at all um, having a big mystery again, I, I'm not really sure if it's necessary to be playing a game of Clue all season long. And I, I've found that it's like, you know, uh, it's just, oh, oh, we're doing another mystery. Oh, okay. And I just didn't find that overly satisfying and then finally, uh, that we get no more Yo and Cronenberg scenes together. <laughs> I'm super bummed about that because those two together, that was just electric and force against force. Um, actor, director, producer against actor, director, producer. And man, I was just dying for more of those scenes. All right. Well, uh, for me, my least favorite things of season three, one of them's kind of eh, but and I got to say, I, I called it out when it happened. I just, I was not a fan of the parasitic ice story. Um, <laughs> I understand that it eventually, you know, people explain that it's a real thing and this, I just, I just, it never grabbed on for me. I just didn't really like it too much. Um, I also did not like the, um, having to always be relying on technology this season. Bill, you've brought this up before, and I I really started thinking about it. The upgrades to Discovery, the programmable matter, the badges that did everything. We've talked about how Star Trek was about humanity and not the um, having to count on technology all the time. And I felt that that was kind of done a little bit too much this season. And once you said it, Bill, and I started thinking about it, it really started to bother me a lot more and more as the season went on. Um, And kind of along the same scope and also kind of along what uh, Casey said about Zara, turbo lifts. (laughs) turbo lifts and the discovery slash tardis that was that was to me the low point of the season that is something that i have not been able to get over um i know i really slammed it when it when that episode when it happened um and it still bothers me so please discovery riders don't ever use the turbo lifts and the big giant opening of the tardis and discovery ever again i really would appreciate it (laughs) It's, it's I have just me. <laughs> I know it's it's not just you. It's not just, um, yeah. I have to say you brought up a great point about technology, and I I th- almost included that as one of my points. Um, it it distracted far too often. Yeah. And then there were times where the technology was introduced because it was convenient. Like, did anyone else recall Discovery getting a cloaking device until <laughs> no. they went to use it? Right. No. Um, so right. clearly, the Treaty of Algeron is not a thing anymore because there's no more Romulus, but. Um, it would have been nice to know that Discovery had that going in instead of it being a convenience mm-hmm. um, at the time it was employed. So I have to agree with that completely, Dan. No, no, yeah, mm-hmm. there were, you know, sometimes people say that we always love Discovery so much and we never say anything bad about it. There are things that we don't like about it, and I'm glad that we each were able to come up with three things that were the low point of the season. Doesn't mean we didn't like it, we didn't love the show, but we really did uh, have some things, Bill. And we all gave it a thumbs up on the season. I mean, yeah, that's the important takeaway yep. here. Absolutely. We all enjoyed the season, Yep. but uh, th- there's still things that we think could have been done differently. Nitpicking is allowed, people. It is okay. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of that, let's talk about 
about one of the things that was like a main arc for the entire season, and that's the burn. Um, we talked about, Bill, you talked about one of the things that you didn't like was the, the payoff on the buildup. It was like it was going to be this gigantic thing. And not to say that it wasn't true Star Trek in what the cause was. And like you said, the finale really made it an emotional moment. But what did you guys think? Sarah, did the burn work for you? And if it did, why? And if it didn't, why not? I mean, as I'd said, it, it wasn't the choice that I would have made for where Starfleet was or wasn't <laughs> in 900 years. But I think that it was a really well-told story once you have watched the season and you take in all of it. Um, I am really excited at the idea of another season where they're going to be trying to go back to find some of those people that used to be a member of, of Starfleet and reconnecting because the burn caused not only for the majority of people to die, but for that ability to travel. So all in all, it worked for me. Um, it was a surprise. It was nothing I would ever have thought up in my whole entire life. And I think that's great. I think that goes to show how imaginative the writers are. Bill, what do you think? I, I have to agree with that. I, I applaud the writers, uh, the job the writers did this season with architecting the burn. I may not have liked the buildup, but in the end, the reasoning behind it was just so tragic and emotional and, uh, you know, traumatic, especially for Sakal. So um, I, I have to say, I liked the concept of the burn. I like what it means in the scope of future seasons, like like Sarah said, you know, and sort of getting some of these planets back together, like, here's your dilithium, come visit us. Um, but I, I think overall, in hindsight, the burn works. I just think they could have built up to it a little differently. I agree with that 100%. Uh, all through the season, I, we were talking about, oh, it's going to be this big, gigantic thing. Is it the discovery from the future, from the short trek that caused the burn? So it's kind of a temporal paradox, and that's just going to be mind-blowing. What's going to happen? And then we find out it was bas basically caused by an emotional reaction from a very traumatic event. And while that buildup may have been kind of lacking in what the actual result was, what caused it was truly, for me extremely emotional, like you said, Bill. So it did work for me in a lot of ways. Uh, you actually uh, made very specific references to grief in last uh, the last time we got together and talking about the humanity aspect uh, of the episode and what could be more perfect uh, in that discussion than what we saw him go through with the death of his mother and causing this to happen uh, based on what happened with his DNA uh, interactions with himself on the planet. So I, in the end, at the beginning, uh, at, at the beginning, I wasn't too sure about what to think in the middle. I'm like, Oh gosh, what's going to happen. But at the end, it totally worked for me. So I thought it was really great. Casey, what about you, buddy? Well, I think we've, we've all been talking about it and I, that way it worked. So all season long, mm -hmm. We talked about it, whether we weren't sure it was going to work, not work, liked it, didn't like it. Um, it got the, you know, your interest flowing more as like, what is, what is this going to be? So for me, yeah, it kind of worked. It really opens up a lot of storytelling. And then you, you can have reasons for going to these other planets. You don't have to make something up. It's like, hey, you've got this built-in narrative device that you can use easily to then do more story in each episode that doesn't have to be, well, why why are you going to this planet? You know why we're going. And then when you get there, see what happens. So overall, I think it did work really well for setting up the next season. Well, we've talked about the main arc of the season. We've talked about things we liked and things we haven't liked. Let's talk about specific characters and what we thought for the entire season. And of course, the one that everybody, th at least I think we need to talk about first, is Burnham. She's now captain. And we've talked about the things that she's done wrong since the first episode of Discovery and the things that she's done right. Is it the right call, Bill, to make her captain of Discovery right now after the things we've seen happen? I think it is. And I think it's because... She's had her own revelation on the fact that she's where she belongs. She wasn't sure at one point this season. In fact, she was doing everything she could to get away from Starfleet. But now that she's she's realized, again, what it means to her and the fact that everybody else gave up everything for her, I think she realizes that she really is in the right place. If you go all the way back to the Vulcan Hello, season one, episode one, you know, Philippa Giorgio told her that it was time for her to get her own ship. 
you know, yeah. she's, she's ready. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's taken Michael a while to figure out that she truly is ready. So I, I think it's a, the right call. Sarah, what about you? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I want two shows now. I want one where she's captain and the one where she's not captain. Cause I don't know how I feel about it. I think that in some ways that she's not ready and she doesn't know if she is. Um, but that's the way I perceive it. I, um, I'm excited to see her try and see how, I, I hope it lasts too. Like I'm just, I, I'm having a hard time thinking anybody in that role just because it feels like it's been jumping around so much. It's funny that you say that about, is she ready? Because that's one of the things that I was most concerned about when Saru became captain. And we saw that, at least in my opinion, he wasn't ready. Um, he had a lot of things. And and we'll get into Saru and what, what his character is going to be like shortly. But I like that that uh, comparison uh, between was he ready and what you said about, about Burnham being ready. Casey, what about you? Was it the right call to make her captain at the end of the season? Uh, yeah, this is the star of your show. You know, <laughs> it's like when you are top build... And like they hold, literally hold filming for you for months because you're starring on another show. And then you come here. It, you know, there there's going to be advancements for this character. Doesn't necessarily mean a promotion, but it did. So yeah, this is this is, you know, I'm gonna say her show. And I love that. It's like yeah, she's done some stuff where we scratch our heads, but haven't we all done stuff where we scratch our heads and go, <laughs> God, I was a dumbass. Why did I do that? And then you get called on stuff, and then you learn from it. And I think she's really done that. Well, isn't, isn't that what's great about what Admiral uh, Vance said to her in the finale about, you know, comparing what his daughter was like to what Michael is like, and they do the same things. They do things that aren't always by the rules. And I got to say... How many times did Kirk break the rules? All the time. How many times did All Cisco times. Cisco poisoned a planet mm -hmm. and yeah. we never saw any ramifications? She did things that she thought were going to work to help the issue at the moment. And I think that shows thinking outside the box to an extent. So I think making her captain was definitely the right call for the end of the season after seeing that journey that she has been on. And Sarah, you brought it up earlier. She was there for a year before the rest mm -hmm. of the crew got there. We didn't get to see a lot of what happened during that year, but she grew. And she had questions about whether Starfleet was still for her. But in the end, she did what she needed to do to, to, to uh, complete the mission. And I think it was right for her to become the captain. I found it very interesting when Discovery was first announced that this was going to be the first time that the main character was not a captain. And a lot of people were scratching their heads about it. And it worked while that was the case, but I think it was about time with the evolution of the show that we got to the point where she finally became captain, and I'm glad it happened. Um, but things are not all uh, going to be rainbows and unicorns uh, for <laughs> Captain Burnham, I don't think, uh, especially when you look at the way that Stamets gave her that stink eye at the end of the finale. So, uh, Sarah, let's start with you. We know that he is very upset for what she did in order to save or to complete the mission. Now that everything came out okay and rosy and everybody's back together, do you think that this is a relationship that can be um, uh, patched up? And do you think it'll take a long time for that relationship to get back to normal? Um, I'm, part of me says I don't care because I don't know how much I like that storyline. Um, there's work to be done. Um, people need to move on and people need to be accepting of situations and choices and that's a big chunk of how I feel, but I'm kind of enjoying watching Anthony Rapp be this character, which makes me hate him. And that to me is a sign of like such good actor when I'm just like seething and yeah. I'm just like, I don't want to see this. And I'm so it's, it's a tough one. I, I hope if they do it, they, they do it right. And I trust that they will. So. One of the things that I remember saying back in season one, when we first met this character was I said to you, Bill, I think I said, man, he is a jerk. This character is just a jerk. He's he's mouthing off to everybody. He seems to be, you know, in love mm -hmm. with himself. Grow, he's grown to be one of my favorite characters. Anthony Rapp does a fantastic job. And I really like how he reacted to everything that happened at the end of the season. Now, for me personally, I've been doing a lot of thinking about what's going to happen next season. And, of course, we have Burnham as captain. I think, uh, I think Stamets is a great possibility 
for first officer based on his experience, based on his rank, because I know we mm. talked about rank and whether it would work. We've seen other science officers be first officers before and, you know, engineer slash science officer, whatever you want to clarify him as. I think it would work, but it's not going to work if the relationship is as fractured as it is right now. So I'm hoping that they're able to get that all behind themselves quickly so that he can become the first officer next season. And no disrespect to, to Tilly, but as we've all talked about, was it the best choice or not is, is a discussion for another time. But but I'm hoping that this relationship gets repaired kind of quickly. But I also, at the same time, hope that even if it does, that there are some aspects of it that can come back to haunt Burnham later in the season when things are getting kind of dicey. Bill, what do you think? Um Yes to all of that. So, you know, famously in Rick Berman's office during his time producing Star Trek, there was a bust of Gene Roddenberry. And at times they would blindfold that bust so that Gene couldn't see that they were breaking the Roddenberry rule so, so terribly. And that Roddenberry rule was that, you know, everybody on the ship had to get along. There could be tension in, in an episode, but at the end of the episode, they all had to get along again. You know, there could be no long-term conflicts or drama between the main characters of the show. And Discovery is taking uh, what I think is is a fantastic turn of events, taking that Roddenberry rule and just ignoring it completely because I love some good drama. And I think that this is going to extend into next season. It's going to take something pretty significant and severe for them to patch things up. Maybe the two of them are, you know, on an away mission and, and trapped somewhere, um, you know, and in some kind of situation where they have to work together and get over their differences, which would be also very Star Trek. But, um, I, I, I think the relationship can be repaired. Um, I think it will be repaired, but not too quickly. Casey, what do you think? You agree with that? Do you think it'll be, uh, something that's, um, taken care of like in the first episode? I'm hoping it's not something that gets taken care of right away. I've, I kind of like the fact that there's going to be an edge between them. I like what you said, Dan, about him possibly being first officer, where he will see what is, I think, best for the entire crew, but not a yes person. And is saying, I don't think you're thinking about this. I don't think you're thinking about this. Um, When, you know, at the end of this season, um, he's, he's there in the line, welcoming her as captain. Now, not warmly, but he's there. So I think part of that's going to be where as, as, you know, if it flame burns bright and fast, it also goes down fast. So it's going to be really harsh for a bit. But then, since he's a very thinking character, I think more of that's going to come through. I think part of the stuff with Gray, Adira, might be something that works him through that. Mm -hmm. And... That, you know, I I get a little bit of Bones vibe here of, hey, you know, deep down I am your friend, but I am not going to just be your yes person. Well, I'm glad that you brought that up uh, with Gray because we're going to get into kind of a gray area right now. Uh, I didn't write that. Bill actually wrote that. So give credit where credit is due. That was a, that was a great I didn't uh, write in the, segue. the stupid laugh, though. No, you didn't. That was, that was, that was all me. <laughs> what an so, improv. Yeah. So, so we saw what happened and I really, I really did like what we saw with the character of Gray at the end of, uh, at the end of the season where they could see him on the hollow ship um, and they need to figure out a way so that everyone can see and communicate with Gray. And I actually am hoping that in season four, Burnham is the one who comes up with what is the resolution to that so that everyone can see gray. And that's what helps patch that relationship uh, with Stamets and Burnham, whether it happens or not, I don't know, but let's talk about that whole thing with gray and Adira and, and, and how only they can see gray, but nobody else can and what they're going to do to let this trill ghost person, person, communicate with the rest of the ship. Sarah, what do you think? Do you think that's something that's going to be a major plot point in season four? I think so. Um, and I hope they play it out like uh, next phase in TNG where there's a jazz uh, funeral and uh, phasers are going, <laughs> Roe and Jordy <laughs> show up. And <laughs> that's one of my favorite episodes of TNG. Um, no, I. it was such a weird plot line. Again, like this season has had so many storylines I just never would have thought of, which is great because it just goes to show how many different things are out there that haven't been told yet. And this is one that I'm very curious about. I really hope that we get to see 
gray, all of us. And um, I, I like what you said, Dan, about having this as a way that Michael Burnham can kind of maybe win over a little bit of love from Stamets is by helping with yeah. that. So let's see. Yeah. <laughs> that would be nice. And and Bill, I think we've talked about this before. One of the most emotional points of the entire season was when Culber was able to see Gray and just immediately yeah. hugged him and, and welcomed him to the family because they are now a family. Adira, mm-hmm. Gray, Stamets, Culber. So is this something that you think uh, should continue and will be a major one. I, I think I'm in agreement with Sarah that I think it should be something that we definitely get to see a lot more of in season four. What are your thoughts on it? I'm still struggling to understand how the thir- oh, yeah. 30th century hollow deck, and I say 30th because the, the Kelpian ship had been there for 125 years. So it was outside and not 31st century, 32nd right. century, 31st century hollow deck could take the latent image of a past host from a true symbiont <laughs> and recognize it as a life sign to build a holographic construct around. If I can get my head around that and I'm having a hard time with it, mm-hmm. um, I, I could see that they could create the equivalent of a 32nd century hollow, mobile hollow emitter um, for gray. But I, th- I think that's a huge leap. Do I think that's what they'll do? I do. Do I understand how it makes sense? Not remotely. And I'll be candid about that. I kind of, it kind of makes me wonder, are they ever going to explain the whole reason behind Gray being able to communicate the way that he communicates with Adira now? And that it's not just past memories that every other Trill host has dealt with. Is it something because Adira is human? Uh, And they kind of touched on it for like two seconds uh, in one episode, but they really haven't built upon that, Casey. And you got to wonder if that's something that they'll explain a little bit more. Because as Bill said, the whole holodeck thing is way out there. Yeah, it is. Um, I, I hope there's a bit of explanation, but not hand-holding us down the path. I don't need everything explained explicit to me, explicitly to me. Um, I, I can see how maybe they use Eli, the lie detector bow tie guy, as maybe they use part of that to be able to have a full hologram of gray that everybody can actually interact with. Um, uh, this is on something where I go, you know what? There's, there's times I don't want a full explanation. There are certain things that I can live with a bit of, of, of mystery. And maybe they just say, hey, you know, you have, we haven't ever joined with human. Maybe this is what happens. And mm-hmm. that we don't know, so that they're not locked into anything story-wise. They can just go where they want to. Well, I, I, we know for a fact that Gray will be back next season. So um, whether just Adira can see him or not will be interesting to see what happens. So let's talk about the one other character that I think we need to talk about yeah. this week for our Season 3 wrap-up. And and I every week, it seems, I gave him a Starfleet commendation. And that's uh, Saru, portrayed by Doug Jones. Um we saw him go through quite an evolution this season with becoming captain and playing the role really well, but then you saw some of the cracks in whether he was ready to become captain, especially when that hollow image of the Kelpian uh, scientist was found. And he has gone back to uh, Kaminar um, to help uh, with with um, uh, Sakul uh, and his Sukal. Uh, Sukal, I was I always screw up those those consonants and 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 how he reintegrates into society after so long. We know for a fact, Bill, that Doug Jones is filming season four. He's talked about it. Um, he's been up there in Toronto, so he will be back. But what do you think he will be back as? Will it be only seeing him on Kaminar? Will he be back on Discovery? And what will his role be, do you think, in season four? I think he'll start off on Kaminar. I think he'll very quickly transition back to Discovery, where where he'll be Michael Burnham's first officer. That's kind of an interesting uh, mm. switcheroo, huh? It's the only one that makes sense, yeah. honestly. It, it, yeah, it really does. Uh, Sarah, do you agree with that? What do you think? Yeah, I think that that's exactly what's going to happen. And Casey, are you in uh, agreement? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I would really like a a parallel time frame Saru limited series where he's <laughs> not on Discovery, but that we could see what's going on with him on Kaminar while other things are going on in Di- at Discovery. 
Oh, yeah, of course he's going to be back. You know, yeah. they're they're going to do the thing where maybe maybe you get a scene with him, one or two scenes for the first couple episodes, and then he's back in. Uh, right. You you can't you can't not play that awesome card. Yeah, he he will definitely be back. In. This is not going to happen. I can guarantee it. I don't know anything, but I'm saying this is a this is a far reach. I would love as much as I. Um, love the mirror universe and I'm glad that they wrapped it up and don't necessarily need to see the mirror universe again because of how they did it this season. I would love to have a mirror universe episode specifically focused on Saru of the mirror universe and what it was like after the big battle mm-hmm. that we saw where he saved That'd be cool. Philippa. And what happened, you know, he went through the Vaharai and and he survived and now he has that confidence. I would love to see what happened with that character. I really doubt we will, but that that's a wish list, I guess. But uh, I, I, he's going to be back. And, and I do agree with Bill. I think that he will become the first officer if Stamets doesn't, because I'm still going for Stamets first. Casey, what do you say? I, I love what you talked about right there. And that's where I think that this whole franchise could really have a a run of small limited series, whether it's two or three episodes, where you could deep, deep get into some of these characters and not have it affect, you know, the regular stuff that's going to be going on for Discovery. I mean, if we're getting short treks and all these other type of things, it's like, hey, you know, it, it's possible to get a 20 minute or to see at least something of like what you were talking about. Yeah. Kind of like a little Star Trek you know, Saru. Yeah. Kind of like a Star Trek Shasky or something like that. That'd be kind of awful. Anyway. Yeah. Very, um, <laughs> very. Oh no, a, 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 a great, a great season wow. three, great discussion about season three guys. I, I, I just always love having all the different opinions that we get on the show, but right now it's time for a very, very important part of discovering Trek. It's one of the newest segments, but it's one of the most thought provoking, at least for some of us. And that's uh, Sarah's question corner. You know, she makes us put our thinking caps on. We're not bright. We're all, we're three dumb guys here. No, Sarah's two. the brains There's behind two. this. <laughs> the, okay. So Bill and Casey, uh, <clears throat> but uh, she's going to put us on the spot with a question. We have not heard oh. the question and uh, it's, it's all on you, Sarah, to, 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 to do it right. So uh, it's all yours. A question. All right, guys. Um, <laughs> I I struggled with this one, and so it's not going to be a deep, um, soul-searching question. It's just a good old, I'm a Star Trek fan question. So, for me, watching this season, and they're 900 years in the future, there's so many things you have questions about, about what happened, where people are. What one alien species slash planet are you disappointed that we didn't get any information on in this season? Bill. Oh, wow. I get to go first. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, that's really tough. I mean, we, we got so little about, you know, Nivar and the Vulcans and the Romulans. We got just enough to, to really paint the context of that episode. I really wanted a little more there, but I almost feel cheated that there wasn't any kind of tie back to the Klingons. Um, because they mm. were such an integral part of Discovery's seasons one and two. Somebody at some point had to go, what about the Klingons? And I think that that might have been interesting. Um, so, uh, other than the fact that I think they're going to wind up seeing the Cardassians next year. But what do I know? Oh, I like that. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, man. All right, I'll go next. Go, Denny. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would have loved to find out what's been going on with the Dominion. Uh, to see what's going on. You know, the last time we saw Odo, he was rejoining the uh, the Great Link, uh, and it's been a long time. Are are they still a powerhouse uh, over in over in the Gamma Quadrant? Um, are they, you know, still enemies? You know, did th- did they get affected by the burn? Uh, I think that would have been something that would have been really cool, Casey. I want to know how many humpback whales are now <laughs> on Earth, because I mean, damn it, we haven't heard a thing. Since we brought those suckers back, and that Klingon <laughs> ship almost destroyed my Golden Gate Bridge. So what what's going on? I mean, we get Cetacean Ops sometime in the future, right? So what's going on there? 
They don't call. They don't write. Uh. Oh, their writing is illegible anyways. It's just, uh. <laughs> they have flippers, Casey. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> they have flippers. I, I, Sarah, that's a great question. There are so many uh, species of plants I would love to see. And I think it just, oh, uh, I'm hoping next year that that is, you know, some of the stuff that we get. And it's just like, hey, this week we're going here. Two weeks from now we're going there. And just to get some some history and backstory and then jumping off places for new stories. Bill, I got to say, I love your take on Cardassia, man. That'll be awesome. Well, remember, that was my long-range scan yeah. and at the yeah. end of last week. So, um, I got, Sarah, what about you? What, yeah. what species uh, or yeah. what planet would, would you wish they, they checked in with? I kind of want to know what's going on with the Ferengi or Q nice. or some of those uh, <laughs> troublemakers that we've come to love in um, other series. Um, that's where I go automatically because those were always some of my favorite episodes and characters. The Gorn. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> what is the Tribbles. whole planet? We ever got uh, Tribbles? Yeah. Wow. All They're, kinds of different stuff. So the possibilities for season four. Endless. Is unbelievable. Endless. Folks, as always, we want to take a moment to thank Fansets for being the presenting sponsor of Discovering Trek and the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. It was an incredible season of discovery. And it has been another amazing season with such an amazing business partner. Every week, it is our honor and privilege to tell all of you the latest releases from Fansets because we know that you want the very best Star Trek pins available, and they are always hard at work to bring you new and exciting additions to your growing collection. That's right. And recently, they released a whole bunch of new Trek pins, including Star Trek Picard episode pins three and four for The End is the Beginning and Absolute Candor. Also from Star Trek Picard, Dr. Agnes Gerardi is ready to add to your collection. And then from some show called uh, D- Discovery. I've, mm. I've not really mm. heard of it. Very we're, good, very we're good. We're happy to have Lieutenant Nilsson join the Fansets yeah. ranks. Now, of course, the Doomsday Machine ship pin has finally been released, which Dan is so excited about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was that, Dan? <laughs> and finally, oh, we've been waiting for this one a very long time. It's finally here. The TNG All Good Things Full Size Delta is yes. now available over at yes. fansets.com. Yes. Now, in addition to all those pins I just mentioned, you can look forward to the latest batch of new releases coming very soon on February 1st. Lieutenant Reese from Star Trek Discovery, Luther Sloan from Deep Space Nine and Section 31, <laughs> the latest releases for the Women of Trek collection, which includes Dr. Christine Chapel, Picard episode pin number five for Stardust City Rag, and if you're hearing this for the very first time anywhere, people, I just want to tell you that the magnetic back Picard Delta pin will be available on the 1st of February. Nice. Uh, I got to tell you, dude, you have no idea how excited I am for that Sloan pin. I mean, well, I guess that's not true. I'm excited for all of them, but Sloan, finally. Uh, Awesome list. Uh, Always love hearing what's coming out. Uh, They're really putting out some great pins lately. Now, just a quick FYI, the All Good Things Delta is just the full-size Delta pin at this time. The mini version and the magnetic version of that pin will be available in the near future, so please keep your eyes on the Fanset social media pages for that that release information. Until then, head on over to fansets.com and check out all the cool stuff they have. Put a bunch of pins and accessories into your cart and then enter the special code word Discovering Trek in all caps with no spaces, spa- spaces, spaces <laughs> at checkout for an amazing 10% off your entire order. And hey, don't forget that if you're in the United States and spend more than $30, you are also going to get free shipping. Fansets, our pins have character. And we thank our friends at Fansets for being the presenting sponsor for this entire season of Discovering Trek. Commendation, palm leaf of Axanar Peace Mission, Grand Kite Order of Tactics, Class of Excellence, Frenteris Ribbon of Commendation. So guys, all season long, we've been giving out these amazing Starfleet commendations that mean absolutely nothing. But you know what's even better than that? What? Season Wrapping <gasps> Starfleet commendations, MVP commendations, the biggest of the biggest comm- commendations, Comm- commemorations, commendations. commendations. Bill? Wow. Yeah, <laughs> commendations. Bad Bill, vowels are tough. <laughs> you know, we we had somebody point out to us in in our our Facebook group, Camp Kittimer, that these commendations are only meaningless if we say they're meaningless. <laughs> so I'm going to say my commendations mean something. So there. 
Wow. Yeah. Ooh, so Point uh, taken. Point taken. So my very meaningful commendations go to the following. First up, the visual effects team. They really kicked it up a notch this season. I thought it was difficult after last season that they could really top themselves. But you want to talk about feature film looking work for television. They really nailed it all season long. Second, I have to say, uh, showrunner Michelle Paradise gets a commendation from me. Um, she'll be the first Discovery showrunner to touch more than two seasons. Because remember, she was brought in the tail end of season two. Right. Here, all of season three, and is going to be there for season four. Nice. Um, plus, uh, just the way the season worked and, and flowed together was really a testament to, to the writer's room. Uh, next, I got to say, Dougie gets a season commendation. Doug Jones for his performance as Saru. Um, Dan, like you said, you must have mentioned him every single week and deservedly so. Wilson Cruz gets a season ending commendation because Cole Burgess was next level this season and uh, really cemented himself as one of Starfleet's finest doctors. And then lastly, I mean, you had to know this one was going to come up. I think I gave a commendation to her more weeks than I did. And that's top of the call sheet, Sinequa Martin Green. What an amazing, amazing job. She did his Burnham this season. It does every season, but she really, really, you know, kicked it up even higher this year. Absolutely. Great, great commendations. That do mean something, Bill. They do. So thank you for that. Yes, Sarah, what do you got for the commendations for the season? Three awards are coming out this time. Sonequa Martin-Green, because she is just... Uh, I'm speechless. She's great. And I'm enjoying everything that she's doing. And her character has had so many changes and so many arcs and so many lows and highs. And she's just knocking out of the park. And I'm, I'm really glad because I was really excited for her to take on this show. And the fact that she's killing it is great. Mr. Anthony Rapp. Hate to love him, love to hate him. That's where I'm at right now with this guy. This character is killing me. And that means something to me because that goes to show how invested I am in whatever that story is that they're doing. So my big shout out goes to Anthony Rapp for this amazing work on this season. And lastly, we barely saw him. Barely at all. Adil Hussain. I thought had one of the most beautiful scenes in Star Trek yes. history, in my opinion, and it stuck with me throughout the whole season. And I was glad we got to see him again at the end. So I really would like to see more of that character and that great actor. So those are my uh, shout outs. That is a great point. That was the first tear inducing moment of the season for me was, was that scene at the end of the first episode. Great commendations, uh, Sarah. Casey? Time for to see what you got. Uh, no, you know what? I'm going to make you wait. You're going to wait till last. All right. I just, I just, yeah, I'm just going to, I have a feeling. So for me, um, I'm going to give a tie for my top honor of commendations uh, for the season. And Bill, you said it a few minutes ago. I, I did it pretty much every week. Doug Jones. Dougie, he's got, he's simply amazing in every scene he does as Saru. And this season, we got the added bonus of seeing Doug as Doug as Saru. Uh, it was it was awesome to see him out of all that latex and and prove that he is a great actor underneath all that latex. So just love that guy so much. And I got to give top honors to Odin Fair for uh, his portrayal as Admiral Vance. It was amazing. My favorite Admiral I've ever seen in Star Trek. It was so great to see him in Star Trek because I'm a huge fan of his already. And I I God I hope he's back in season four. I really kind of think he will be, but uh, I'm praying. And Bill, I gotta, I gotta say what you said. I gotta give a, a commendation to the special effects team. Right from the very first scene in Star Trek Discovery season one, with the pullback um, from Takuma uh, uh, from his eyes, um, it's, there's never been anything like it in television. I don't think with the special effects that they that they do. And this season was on a level that deserves every possible award. So uh, congratulations to them. So those are my three. And now Casey. I know it, we've been building it up so that you oh, can just God, like thanks. completely. I can only imagine how long awards, this list so, is. Oh so my I'm going to take a nap and just let me know when you're done. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I have none or all MVPs, so I, I'm not playing any favorites. I am going to commend every single person that worked on this season in such crazy and trying times. Um, each individual was the most valuable person in the duties they were hired. To fulfill, think about having to do this entire show, right? A right. lot of the stuff from home, and not have to, to be dealing with you know jack holes like you three every <laughs> single day. <laughs> 
I'm, and it was like, you know, and, and I will be sending plaques to every single person. They will be arriving in 2041. But, <laughs> ser- you know, but seriously, I just kept thinking about such a huge production. And when you're trying to make sure everyone is working safe, that um, you keep the calendar moving forward and everything that had to happen for special effects, like you guys are talking about, that, you know, happening at home and coordinating yeah. all that. So I really thought there's just so many people that do jobs that probably don't get recognition that in times when entertainment was getting thin and solid, good entertainment was really thin, I, I appreciate that very much from them. I got to say, man, I, you must have a very interesting perspective of that. And I'm glad that you that you that's what you gave for your accommodation, because you kind of ran the show at the set for STC when you were doing your stuff. So you mm-hmm. kind of have a different perspective of of keeping things on track and making sure things are moving forward. So I really appreciate that you uh, that you give that accommodation the way that you do. That's Bill? an amazing audible he just called because in the notes, it just says he wants to thank craft services. <laughs> I love Crafty. I love you. Oh, peanut butter M&Ms all the time. Thank you very much. Well, well, thankfully, uh, or maybe not thankfully, Bill, uh, that's going to do it for our season three coverage of Star Trek Discovery. But fret not, because Discovering Trek will be back sooner than you know it to break down even more Star Trek. Oh, and I am absolutely fretless over this. It's rare I get to do this part, so I'm very excited. In a few weeks, Star Trek's first frontier will be the next frontier of Discovering Trek. Our co-hosts, Sarah and Casey, will return with Discovering Trek Enterprise as they begin to take a look at that series during its 20th anniversary year. No pressure. Until then, remember that you can subscribe to Discovering Trek by searching for us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or by heading on over to discoveringtrek.com. If you enjoy what we're doing here on Discovering Trek, and I hope you are enjoying it, and the Trek Geeks Podcast Network, please consider supporting us on Patreon. As a subscriber, you can get access to the unedited recordings of episodes, as well as exclusive content and great subscriber rewards, like our annual supporters pins from fan sets and our exclusive Trek Geeks Podcast Network t-shirt. Among other things, we'd like to take a moment to recognize the following amazing producers of Discovering Trek. We are incredibly thankful for their support. Mike Bovia, Chaz Bradshaw, Ken Bird, Kyle Castillo, Peter Craig, Craig Ewing, Al Godwin, Jackie and Chris Hackney, Kimberly Hartman, David Hood, Tony Lambest, Lino Marchand, Matt McGonigal, Jim McMahon, Charlie Mulvey, Sean O'Halloran, Jamie Rogers, Chris Trebuzio, Ken Tripp, Christina Werther, and of course, the lovely and talented Jess Vashon. If you would like to become a producer of Discovering Trek or even get access to the raw audio for Discovering Trek episodes, which you'll want, well, just Casey and I get going, head on over to <laughs> patreon.com slash trekgeeks for all the details. Well, I, I I sincerely mean this, guys. It has been so awesome to talk about <clears throat> Discovery Season 3 with the three of you. It's awesome that uh, Sarah and Casey are going to be uh, taking over the reins for Discovering Trek Enterprise. But uh, Casey... Oh, actually, you know, you guys will be able to do this every week. Bill, where can people <laughs> find you online? I know this is really a change. I kind of dig this. I know it's awesome. This is really awesome. Maybe you know, on Discovery Trek Enterprise, they'll maybe they'll they'll bring us back every now and then. No, just to... it's guest hosts. No, oh. no. no. Sarah well, said in which no. case, I can be found on the tweet machine as uh, Trek Geek Bill. Quick and easy, Casey. What about you, man? After you stop snorting uh, laughter, I mean, uh, where can oh, people what, find you just... online? Uh, I think Sarah's frozen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can twi- find me every now and again on Twitter, Casey Shasky, and every now and again Facebook, hanging out in Camp Kittimer with you crazy shenanigans peoples. Shenanigans, people. Sarah, how about you? Where can I find you? He's lurking in Camp Kittimer. Let's be honest, people. <laughs> <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at Trek Rewind. 
Trek Rewind. And of course, I can be found at Trek Geek Dan. And as with Casey and Bill, I am always in Camp Kittimer. Uh, it is, you know, just the, the most positive group on Facebook. Casey, I think you have one more thing to say. One more thing before you wrap us up for 23 hmm. weeks. Thank you to for having us on here with you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. Thank you for being the people that you are because being able to look forward to hanging out with you all and do this has been, as people say, a godsend during these times. So no matter what Jess Vashon says about you guys, I think you're fantastic. <laughs> it's all and true, thank though. thank you very much. It's all true. <laughs> oh, you know what? I, I sincerely mean we could not do it without you two. When we started Lower Deck, start discovering Trek Lower Decks, we had such a great time. It only made sense to have you guys come on for um, sharing the spotlight every other week um, for this season of Discovery. It really was great, and and I, I honestly mean it from the bottom of my heart. Bill and I are so excited that you guys are going to be uh, taking over doing Discovering Trek Enterprise for the foreseeable future, uh, and it's going to be fantastic. So thank you uh, to both of you. We really love you guys a lot. And and by the foreseeable future. He does mean forever. Ever. Yeah. Ever and ever. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm going on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> well, in all sincerity, that's going to do it for season three of Star Trek Discovery. We hope you've enjoyed our analysis every week here on the Star Trek Universe Companion. We thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to listen to us talk about this amazing new chapter in the Star Trek Universe each and every week. We wouldn't be here without your support, and we thank you so very much. Discovering Trek will be back soon as Sarah and Casey dive in on the Star Trek Enterprise pilot episode, Broken Bow. Until then, here are some words of wisdom from Captain Jonathan Archer. See what I did there? Oh. We're going to stumble and make mistakes, but we're going to learn from those mistakes. That's what being human is all about. And until next time, never stop discovering. Music for Discovering Trek is provided by Five Year Mission. They're writing an original song for each episode of Star Trek. Hear more of their music at fiveyearmission.net. Discovering Trek is a production of Coconut Media Works. Executive producers Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. For more great Star Trek discussion, discover the other shows of the Trek Geeks podcast network at trekgeeks.com or find us in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app.